Investing insights with Right Property Group. Exploring trends in real estate and helping property investors gain financial security. Uh, good everyone. How are you going? Phil Tarrant here. I'm one of the co-hosts of Investing Insights with the Right Property Group. In the studio here in uh, North Sydney, we're social distancing. Uh, we've had our compliance people come through with a very large ruler tape measure to ensure that we are more than two metres apart. It feels like it's uh, miles apart, but um, we thought we'd come together and uh, and do it in person just so we can keep connected, see what's going on and ensure that the audio quality is up to the standard that we'd like to deliver it. So uh, in the studio with me, Steve Waters and Victor Kumar, both directors of the Right Property Group and uh, co-host of this podcast, which has now been going for, Victor, three years. There we go. How you been, mate? Glad right. someone been, knows. We've been, yeah. been good, Phil. I mean, normally you are distant anyway, but you're socially <laughs> distant right now, isn't you? <laughs> distance. Um, that doesn't distance make the heart grow fonder or something or other? I can tell you, it's not the case with you, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, careful, man. I've been in isolation for quite a while, so I need to get into my soapbox really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been locked down, mate. You've been uh, working remotely just doing everything via Zoom, connecting with clients, doing all that sort of stuff. Has things changed except for the, how you're doing, connecting with people? Yeah, certainly. Uh, we've been working. I've been working from home and uh, occasionally coming to the office and uh, having the office all to myself when uh, Steve's not there. Mm. But, you know, certainly the inspections are still happening where we can travel and uh, particularly where there isn't a, you know, large pool of people and, and I prefer where the properties aren't tenanted. Mm. Otherwise, you know, we're getting the agents to actually broadcast it to us as they're walking through the property. So, you know, we use technology to the best of its ability. So the show goes on. The show goes on. And how are you finding it with your buyer's agent, your people on the ground? Are they, you know, what's their attitude or optimism towards operating in this particular market? Is it, as it always has been, it's a great time to be investing in property irrespective of what the environment is? Look, I'm actually loving it personally Mm. uh, because as we would have said in previous podcasts, we've been through a version of this before. So if we're obviously referring to the GFC, and this one is obviously the GVC mm. in that sense. The So we've been through that. So we know how to change and tack and re-strategize to cater for today's market, but the fundamentals never change. Mm. The fundamentals never change. And in fact, Steve, if you recall, you know, part of our partnership was actually formed during the GFC when we were actually locking horns at auction in, in the oh, Greater is, West. Is, is, this, is this the origin story, is it? Is this, <laughs> have this, have we ever gone into that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, let, let's do it. Okay, well, yeah. let, let's do the origin story. And, and Victor, thanks for bringing us here. It's, it's pretty good, and, and this is the organic nature of this podcast, but and this is for my benefit as much as all of our listeners, I actually wanted to use this as an opportunity for us to, to have a look at this journey that you guys have been on because – where we were at the GFC, and when you look at the industry, which was buyer's agency or property strategist, is very different than mm. what it is today. Mm. And you're probably a handful, two of a handful of people who have probably have the scar tissue and that collective and learned experience of operating through what has been a number of different market mm. cycles, some of them which are just the business of real estate and their natural market cycles. Some of them are more manufactured, and by that I would talk about, you know, APRA or the regulatory connectivity and how they've sort of changed and shaped the market over the last sort of four or five years through mortgages and then the GC and now we are with COVID-19. So, you know, how can we actually get that information out of you guys to know how to go through a market like this based on your experience? But what is that origin story? The origin. So you guys used to compete against each other for properties. Uh, um, I'll give you my version. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put, Victor will give his own. Go, <laughs> on, go on lie on the couch. There's a little waterfall there. With, uh, the, the thing yeah. here, folks, uh, if you're listening, is that whoever goes first embellishes a lot more than the second person. <laughs> no, I just call it how I see it. Oh, um, I want to hear about skullduggery. I want to hear about, you know, bananas in exhaust pipes. I want to hear about this sort of stuff. Is there- <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So I've been a buyer's agent since, I don't know, 2002, three or something mm. like that, yeah. And I used to frequent certain areas to purchase quite a lot of property throughout the Blacktown area back then. Mm. And uh, and it was during the GFC that I noticed there was this other dude. that Better was, looking dude. That was starting to- Well-dressed? No. No, 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 no. He wasn't well-dressed. <laughs> um, things have changed. And so- he started to be at these auctions. In, in fact, I think there was one day where there was like seven or eight auctions on a Saturday by various agents. And so I, I saw him at the first, because when you go to auction, you're always looking at everybody, and, you know, especially when a fresh face comes in, mm. you think, well, who's this guy? And um, 
I was watching the way that he that he bid in a very amateurish fashion, might I say. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> but jittery, uh, messing up his yeah, numbers. Yeah, yeah, like just had no clue. It, um, no, no, it's <laughs> not the truth. But we kept sort of stop bidding at around the same price on each of these properties. And just as a side note, it wasn't as though we were the only two there. There was like a dozen registered bidders, even during the GFC. And we got to the last auction of the day and he came up and he said, um, yeah, how you doing? I'm Vic Kumar. And we got talking and he said, how about we go out for a bite to eat? And I said, okay, cool. Is that a date? No, no, it wasn't a date. But we went out for a bite to eat and I, you know, I was thinking, we're going to go to, I don't know, the club or something like that. And we went to Hungry, Hungry Jacks. Jacks. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Which Hungry Jacks was it? I think it was Mount Druitt. Mount Druitt. Yeah, 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 yeah. and, um, and so we order our burgers and everything. Like that, and he gets me to pay, which was, you know, a true buyer's agent. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then I think, because at the time you were doing finance mm-hmm. and you know, you're a large investor in your own mm-hmm. right as well. And we were out actually buying our own properties on that That's day. That's right. Yep. But I was more annoyed at the fact that this blow in would come into my area, which I tended to isolate and, mm-hmm. and want the picks. So uh, turf war. That's what it came down to. Mm. It was gangland style. Yeah. But we went out to lunch, we had a talk. And I think at the time you said, if I could help you find a property. In the inner city, I think it was, mm-hmm. off memory. Yep. And I said, no, I'll mm. play hard to get. No, I just, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, yeah. I just said, no, it's, can't do it. Anyway, it went from there. And then I think the next weekend we saw each other at more auctions and we started to give each other a bit of verbal abuse or banter during the auction process. And then we just decided, you know what, this is – and it eventuated into a friendship. And we said, you know what, and I think Vic's words, exact words were, rather than have the whole world – myself or ourselves, why don't we split it, mm. I think, off memory. <laughs> and so we joined forces there yeah, the, absolutely. Like a couple of months later and yeah. I think each of us brought a different element hmm. you know, to the partnership mm. and still mm. do today. Yeah. Is it, so is that actually the real story, Vic? Is there being sort embellished? Sort of. I'll let him embellish. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let him embellish. But, you know, the, the bounce of the story is correct. Uh, the, the details may be a bit sketchy yeah. uh, in that sense. But, you know. Which parts? <laughs> <laughs> By the part and large, I said yeah, you were yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> By and large, it was like we were, you know, pretty much bidding on the same types of properties. We were relatively stopping at the same numbers mm. in our auction techniques. We were trying to push each other away, uh, you know, trying to unsettle each other, but neither was budging, right? Because uh, we could both see that the other was a pro as well. Mm. Um, and what ended up happening was that the agents started gravitating towards us at any auctions. And um, to this day, we still use the same tactics. Same tactics. So, yeah. And you can spot someone who has done it yeah. a lot in mm. an auction. Mm-hmm. It's quite easy to identify. You just know, right? Well, you, you do, just tell. the way they carry themselves mm. and the way that they bid and I think we've done podcasts on that before. Yeah. And it's worked out well because you need different dynamics at different parts of a market or a cycle and even the way that you look at things. So if you take yourself as an individual investor and there's nothing wrong with that, you're know, trying to do it yourself or doing it yourself. Mm. But there's you still need to rely upon other people to give you a, a different version of what you're seeing. A balanced approach. Yeah, yeah, because you do get lost in your own figures. And to this day, Victor will review my portfolio and – will review his mm. because we do get lost in our own figures and that carries through through to mm. our whole our whole business and the way that we carry out what we do. Yeah, mm. so effectively what we're doing as a business is we are bringing our years of investing pre-GFC and our change of tact and change of the approach towards investing during and immediately post-GFC and then the good times that followed and well, I've been socially isolated, so I'm going to get on my soapbox. Right? Get, do it. So, Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that most property strategists out there have only been a product of a of the recent boom markets. There are very few people that can put their hand on their heart and say, "I have started pre GFC." gone through the GFC, come out the other side, still invested and have come through unscathed, uh, made mistakes along the way, but each, with each mistake I have self-educated and I have then passed on my knowledge to other people. Most people can't look at how to correct in today's market. So a really simple thing in today's market is we look at the um, rhetoric out there. So CBA is saying there's going to be a 10% decline. AMP is saying there's going to be 20% decline. Others saying that they are there's going to be a 30% decline. This poor old Fijian bloke is saying there's probably going to be a 5 to 10% decline, right? And the reason why I say that is that unlike the GFC, 
this scenario here, we are looking at a scenario where money is still very, very liquid. There is a lot of incentive being thrown by both federal and state governments. And equally importantly, our interest rate base is the lowest it's ever been. Sticking at the point, Victor, that you made around you guys have forged your craft as buyers agents during a number of market cycles and, mm-hmm. and what would dominate that would be the GFC, right? Absolutely. You know, you're in the market before that. You guys come together during that period of time and worked out you had commonality in the way you saw the world and your bidding styles and, and how you approach property and you've been able to build a business out of that. What's been the worst time? Like, you know, and you can frame that in your own way. What's been the worst time for you to be in the business of being a buyer's agent or a property strategist? I don't think there ever has been. There hasn't been. Yeah. I would say, though, the most challenging time was on behalf of our clients or speaking for our clients was when APRA mm. intervened. Yep. Mm. And ratcheted up serviceability at 7 plus percent. Yeah, because right? the want was there, mm. but the ability wasn't. Mm which was quite different from, say, the GFC, where there were elements of there was no want. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and today's quite different again, but certainly APRA's handbrake mm. pull was the most challenging. Yeah. So if you look at it from the GFC and the GVC, right, the fundamentals remain the same apart from the liquidity of money. And the only thing that really changes your outcome is your psychology. Yeah. Right. So if you approach this with the right psychology – that you need to simply adjust your portfolio and protect your deposit as you're buying the property. And I'll explain that in a minute. This is no different. And in fact, people that have come off the tail end of a calamity uh, in the sense that there's been a market upheaval, be it a GFC, be it pre-election, as we're talking recently, be post this scenario, those that come off the back of that usually have accumulated immense wealth. So if you look at properties that we're buying, Steve, back during the GFC, just post GFC, and in fact, Phil, your portfolio was started towards the Time. market recovery yeah. phase of the GFC, right? And if you look back, we are buying them at relatively low prices. The yields were fairly high. Yes, I know that the interest rates were higher back then, but you've retained that rental level, give or take 10%, from what it was back then, and the value has pretty much doubled. Yeah. Right? We've gone seven, eight, nine years, and it's pretty much doubled. And that's what's going to likely happen in terms of the property market as such. Yes, we will see some level of decline. There's no doubt about it, right? Mm. Because some people may not be able to hold on to it because there's change of employment. There's going to be change in the way we go about our daily lives after we come out of this. And it's natural that there will be some level of like I said in the last podcast, transfer of wealth Mm. from the unprepared to the prepared. But we will then end up seeing strong recovery in markets with good fundamental. Well, let's identify then the differences between now Mm -hmm. and then. So this crisis versus that crisis. GVC is a global virus crisis, is that what you call it? That's it. I think he's trying to coin that. No, actually, I just read it in the financial review. I'm going to claim it as my own. GVC. (laughs) To be fair, I'm sick of saying coronavirus or COVID-19. And COVID-19 is so ugly as well, right? Corona gives it an element of... Yeah, yeah. Corona stocks right down, right? I would have thought that would have gone the other way. Yeah. I really did. I doubt you probably drink Corona, that sort of cheap domestic lager. You'd be drinking... uh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> You've probably got shares in your own craft brewery, no doubt. The only elite beer I drink is when you supply it. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you know. see there's a fridge out here. It's got VB it. in it. I did see it. <laughs> I thought, it's got I thought big, it was a bit early. No, it's got a big padlock on it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or put your gold coin donation. Yeah, right. yeah. So the G- FC? GFC the G- versus the GVC. GVC. What is the difference, Steve? Let's go through this. And, and Victor said a couple of bits, but let's break it right down. The initial one is that this was more instant. Mm. This had an overall- No one saw it coming. Not at all. And a global effect immediately. And from an Australian economy point of view, it was instant. Mm -hmm. The GFC, we didn't have this, I don't know, whatever it was, 60,000 people unemployed Mm. from one industry in one week. Yeah. There were tells all along the way. Yeah. It was a potential gradual, whereas this has hit hard, quick, fast, and the like. The GFC, the cost of money was circa 7%. Today, Mm -hmm. it's three, three and a half. Yep. The other difference is that- There was no stimulus Hmm. back then. There was no mortgage monitorium back then. So there was a gradual, well, there was an initial decline in all assets straight away. It just happened and property was no different. There was a plunge. 
today we don't have that immediate plunge in property anyway because there's all this stimulus and this, yep. yeah, for want of a better word, get out of jail card for at least six months. And um, there was no legislation back then to protect the tenants. No, and the information transfer back then was very different than what it is today. The way we digest our news the way mm. we, and how many different areas it can come from, whether it be good, bad or ugly. So I think whilst there's few similarities in the initial stages, there potentially could be some similarities as we roll on. Yep. One of them, so coming back to what I think will be different is I don't think there will be a V-curve recovery. Mm. I just mm. I think everyone's using that a little bit too loosely. Too loosely. Because as I as I said before, to have the V curve recovery, there needs to be an inverted V hmm. V curve, if you will, decline in asset prices. And whilst I think some parts of property industry will suffer, I think others will hold firm. Hmm. Yeah, maybe give it that five percent as you mentioned. But I, those very same properties I think you'll see their cash flow improve. And we can talk about that a bit later. So Victor, you mentioned a point which was around buying in this market considering you know, the experience you've had during the GFC and just picking up some of Steve's remarks, but around protecting your deposits. That's right. What do you mean? Yeah. So when we're going into an uncertain market where we are likely to see a decline in value, mm. you need to buy something and then shore up the value so that if you are in a position where you have to sell down, say, in 18 months' time uh, or, or thereabouts, you have the ability to pull back all of your money. Yeah. So a good example would be you'd gravitate naturally towards, say, the cosmetic renovation type property. So it will be a resurgence of the renovation boom as okay. such for investors in particular because that's where we can go in, we can negotiate a lot harder because potentially we are not competing against the first home buyers who incidentally are still out there in full force, mm. right, or the home upgraders. And we can then increase the value immediately and therefore be in a position where our loan to value ratio is compared to the market value of the property puts us in a position where we are not illiquid even if or rather in negative equity if the market continues going down or continues going sideways. So if you're in a position that don't want to, mm. property yes. is potentially where the gold is. That's and, it. Because not everybody is a renovator, but mm. if you have a good team around you, they can help you do that. I think you're 100% right. I think you'll start to see the Bunnings mm. – you know, have a, a massive value increase because everyone will be that renovator, not even the investor, but also the homeowner. Yep. Instead of potentially going out and upgrading to the bigger place, they'll renovate hmm. or they'll spend the dollars there because it's what they're used to and perhaps a little bit more certainty and security around the what if of moving and selling and everything that goes along with that. Yeah. So when you look at look at the scenario, right, and this is coming off the GFC as well, we had, you know, a large portion of our portfolio and those for our clients was tilted towards renovations. However, there was still good value add properties we could buy. So property land content, a property with a twist, right? Mm. So you're not buying a stock standard properties. If you're buying a stock standard properties, they are negotiated really well and I'm making these numbers up. So if everyone's paying 500 for a very similar property, you, you know, so 550 for a very similar property, you're paying 500 for the same property, right? So if it doesn't need renovation, you're negotiating really hard down on the price. But as the market improves, the renovation type properties then start becoming a liability because then you start seeing this advertisement saying handyman special or renovator's mm. dream and all that. That's when to jump out of those types of properties and start getting back into the better looking ones. And it happens every cycle every in that cycle. exact fashion. Because the And to reiterate, the renovating type properties during a time and crisis are where the gold is. Mm. But as the market perpetuates and you do see the agents, that's a time to pivot. You gotta pivot. And yep. then ride the wave of growth rather than trying to create it. That's right. That's right. Whereas so today we need to is. create the growth. Correct. So yep. why is it that those reno properties are more attractive during this period of time? Is that simply because people can't see the value in them or they're transfixated on getting something better? Is this a mindset it's thing? It's around yeah. I think it's around their own the purchase liquidity and their ability to borrow because if they've got a limited amount of capital to begin with, they want something that they can move into or mm. just rent out, whatever the case may be, straight away without having to then put in the capital, which is not borrowed funds, to then renovate it and have time off the market and no income and things like that. Whereas for us, it potentially, given all things stay fair and equal, that by doing the renovation and in giving it that uplift, and a renovation, just to be clear, comes in de many different forms. It could be cosmetic, structural, if you've got the mm. experience. 
adding a secondary income. That's a type of renovation yep. via construction. Yep. But it gives you the ability to potentially recycle that capital mm. in a shorter period of time and not wait for the organic growth fee to be able That's to right, do that. Yeah. So, so that just, you can move uh, on. Yeah, as you're talking, Steve, um, I got reminded of one of the properties we did together just post GFC, which was Smith Street, where all we did was put a fence around it, a white picket fence, I and mowed the lawns. Yeah, so I, I remember and, that. And that was the uh, basis of the renovation. Yeah, and it can be as easy mm. as that because it's cosmetically challenged and therefore not as attractive, clearly, to... Mm-hmm the general hordes. The thing though, I think to be wary, this particular crisis is that people are far more educated this time. That's right. So when we were, right. when yeah. we were doing this during the JFC, we were able to sneak around the edges mm. clearly because that's where we met and, <laughs> um, and be that person. So that, many things I could say. Yeah, <laughs> that, um, Don't go there. Yeah, I was like, which you won't. Um, but the agents would come to us mm. because there wasn't the technology that there is today that's to correct. be able to communicate that with. Is correct. So it was us being in their face. And I still think mm. that's still relatively important today. Today, though, with this crisis, whether it pans out the same or not, people's information is far greater. Mm. Their education and their awareness Yep is so much greater today than what it was back then. Mm -hmm. And on that very point, it might limit the potential contraction in price because there's so many more people doing it today and have been for the last 10 years than what there was when it was a GFC. That's right. And also on the flip side of it as well is that because there is so much information available and so many different avenues that you go down, often for someone that's beginning, they don't know which way to tack on this because there's too much it's information overload as mm. well so you need someone that can guide you through it whether it's a peers you need basically need someone that's got a larger portfolio than you and someone that has gone through and invested for more than say 15 years at the very least so that you've got the ability to tap into the previous experience mm. uh, and um, certainly they should still be investing in today's market so Vic, the question i want to ask you is how important is experience in this current market. You know, we've spoken about this, the differences between the GVC and the GFC and all the different market cycles. But, you know, what is it about experience that that you have, which is going to, and how you're using that experience to shape your strategy? You're just pressing repeat. You're just going, oh, I remember this market. I'm going to go back seven years and deploy the strategy I deployed then. Or is it something a bit more hybrid from that? Uh, to a degree, repeating the same, but adjusting to today's market because mm-hmm. we've got to adjust to today's interest rate, adjust to what the banks are willing to do in terms of lending right now. Uh, so as an example, one of the key things, and these are lessons that we actually got from the GFC, one of the key things that banks will start doing in markets like this is limit the cash out. So what I mean by that is let's say you've got 400K available in equity that you can go back and refinance and pull that money out. Unless you've got a direct segue into another property, most lenders will start to limit your ability to pull all of that 400k out straight away. So we need to obviously adjust for scenarios like that. And certainly, like I said in the beginning, nothing but the psychology has really changed. The fundamentals are exactly the same. So yeah, psychology, Steve, is is in between your ears, right? You know, and, Mm. and this is it. How do you get can you get your psychology right in this market or it's just your psychology is your psychology? I'm sure you can shape it all through or change it through education. but You can shape it, but inherently in a time of crisis, your real risk profile will emerge. Mm-hmm. That's If you're that person that really wants to chase an opportunity, you were always that type of person. Yes, mm-hmm. you can shape it somewhat with education and who you surround yourself with, which has been scientifically proven, mm-hmm. you know, who you hang around with. But inherently, as I said, some people will just say, you know what, I'm going to put a full stop to this. Yep. I need to see other people getting results before I jump in. And there will be others that will just say, well, I'll create it. Mm. I'll do this because I'll stick to the very basics of you know, investing 101 where it's supply, demand, consumer confidence, cost of money. Yeah, and that's what it boils down to, right? So if you look at the GFC and the reason why the psychology is so important this time around, look at the GFC, like you said, Steve, there wasn't that much – information, the the transfer of information wasn't as easy. So we had to actually go to the agent. And in fact, the agents themselves, they were beaten, right? And and, uh, we were a ray of hope for them when we walked into their office. Mm. This time around, every every agent. It's like, we don't need you. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Because the information is out there, it's easily. So the agents are buoyed with that. And equally importantly, the investors or the buyers out there, they're either falling into either side of the camp 
one that's buoyed because they you know they're seeing this as an opportunity or others because of all this transfer of information they're taking a totally negative approach because most of the news is negative well you think about it just look at this podcast or listen it gets you know 10,000 odd downloads every episode mm. if it didn't exist that's a hell of a lot of newspaper articles that's right to get that's right. you know, the same sort of Information. information. But at least the, the information newspaper is much better than what's on this podcast, Steve. <laughs> yeah, you know what it comes down <laughs> yeah. to? It comes back down to the editor and the MC. That's right. right? In, in, in his loud shirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, but, you know, we're fortunate to be able to do this, Vic, because, mm. you know, imagine trying to have this same conversation 15 years ago when the GFC was on. Just there wasn't the mechanisms to do it. And this is immediate. They yeah, weren't no, there. They weren't there. When I first started investing, I've probably told this story a thousand times, but I'll say it one more time. There was none of this. There mm. was... And same with you, Vic. Mm. Investing was a secret society. No one talked about True. it. True. And it wasn't as – so you could go to Fred or, you know, at the barbecue where everyone's an expert, and that was for someone who's listening now, they'll know who I'm talking about, <laughs> uh, where that you could exchange information. It was just, you know, secret yeah. investor business. Nobody the Secret talking. handshakes. You it, know. Was it was that. You know, like a Mason's <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Or something like that. And I remember when we put an ad out on the paper, the trading post, as the story goes, and we had, I think it was one or two replies, and then we all met up, and then the next week there was five people, and the next week mm. there was ten. And before you knew it, there was hundreds because everybody had a thirst to rub shoulders with other investors. And information. And information, yeah. swapping ideas. Yeah. You know? And today it's everywhere. Mm. Yeah. You know, Tune into iTunes or whatever, and there's a million podcasts out there. None are as good as this, clearly. But yeah, it's, oh, no. uh, <laughs> well, obviously the the major journalist co-host is the backbone of this particular product. You know, it's a like a jellyfish backbone. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> well, you so, see this, you see this jellyfish now in the canals of Venice because it's so that. so clean. Mm. You I know? saw that. I it goes saw to that. show how, and this uses a metaphor analogy, how adaptive people can be given current markets and environments, and that's no difference for property investment. Right? And it'll happen this time too. So whilst the GFC created and forged a new type of investor mm. uh, because of you know, various reasons, as we talked about, and technology definitely was one of those because that leads to information and so on, this particular time I think certain types of investors will evolve once again and certain types of investors are going to go back to the bare-bone basics. Yep, yep. So if you're talking bare-bone basics – back during the GFC when we used to walk into an agent's office. We'd ignore the window and we'd ask for them to bring out the lever arch files. That's and, it. I remember yeah, that. Yeah, you, you would. And, and these, these the were plastic the, slips. Yep, yep. yep. And these would be properties that couldn't get giveaway, right, in their minds. So the investors were uninformed because information wasn't easily transferable. So were the agents because they couldn't see what the other agents were doing. Mm. Right, so therefore we'd walk in and we'd make silly offers. And remember, uh, Steve, there was a challenge that I threw your way in terms of a mortgagee. Oh, I forgot. This is in the early stages. Yes, this yes. was. This was. Yeah, mm. I won't elaborate. You tell yeah. the story. Well, so and there, then there was I'll a <laughs> <laughs> there was a house uh, which was a mortgagee in possession in Campbelltown, and um, that's in New South Wales. So not my area either. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's and, your hood, isn't it? That's my hood, right? Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> I and Steve found this property on a leave arch file with the agent. And he comes to me and says, uh, so what would be stealing this property? And without even looking at it and without even thinking, I said, oh, 165 for a three-bedroom house you know, on a 600-square block. So Steve put in that offer and lo and behold, the mortgagee accepted. And if only you could have seen his face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you compare that to today, right, that same scenario today, if you walk into an agent's office, Everything's on the net. So mm. there is no lever arch file. So that same information is accessible to every person that can type in realestate.com.au, right? The only difference is now it comes back to relationship, mm. relationship with the agent and the ability to create relationship, which is what we do on a daily basis. So therefore, the properties that we are able to get is we are able to get a head start on properties before they are loaded on the net, mm. before they are open to the public. And quite often it's done and dusted uh, before it even sees the light of the day. Yeah. So pre-market. Pre-market. Not, not off-market. Not off-market. Yeah, you guys got to go be, be, yeah. be in your bond about this pre-market, off-market. I, I, really go, I hate it. Mm. I just I think it's misleading people that keep saying, look how many off-market properties I got. It's bait advertising. Bait advertising, misleading, just wrong. 
Mm. Ethically, morally. Oh, old soapbox over here. Yeah, no, no, no. here's my no solution. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're talking about, Victor, and yeah. the way I'd, I would uh, conceptualise all this is that property investment has been democratised, right? Oh, I yeah, like that. Yeah, it is. And uh, just a theory on That's my new blog post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but stick with me on this because um, what you were talking about was probably being a secret society prior mm-hmm. to, and, and the whole idea of this podcast where we've landed is GFC versus GVC GBC. and your experience through that. So. So property has been completely democratised now. There is no more lever arch files. And, and, mm. and I don't know if you've ever watched uh, Glenn, Gary, Glenn Ross. Have you ever seen that play or the video? If you've never done it in the movie, go and watch it. You will absolutely love it. It's about a pack of salesmen, right? right. It, it's absolutely brilliant, but they all want these leads, right? Mm. Like the gold leads. But, you know, anyway, I won't go into it. But um, everything's been democratised now, so there's no real advantage to anyone. Mm. All the properties are available. There's no secret little lever arch files in the yep. background. All the information now is accessible. There's no excuse now not to be informed and educated around Absolutely. property. Absolutely, there's podcasts like mm. this, there's Smart Property Investment Show, there's some other good stuff around. You know, there's so much information online. There are so many different groups right now. There's so many chat folks. Like information is democratized. So mm-hmm. there's no advantage. No one has any advantage at all. Right. Yep. The advantage, to your point, now is about relationships and, and relation and, and experience, experience. Mm-hmm. and the connectivity between experience and strategy mm. with execution. Yep. That that is the competitive advantage now in property. Mm-hmm. And property investors need to compete in an environment where people outsource that, myself included, to guys like you to go, I want that advantage, you go and do this with me. So yep. that now is the playing field That's for the property. Edge. That's the edge that we have. Because otherwise, it's just a you know flat playing field. Yeah, it's everything's commoditized. It's like the digital stuff has completely got mm-hmm. rid of of all the things that people used to have an advantage over. So the question is, Steve, can everyone capitalize on this environment right now on that basis? That if you are informed, and educated, if you do have your stuff sorted out, and I'm not talking about distressed people here either, people who have lost their jobs. I'm talking about punters that life goes on, you know, largely unaffected by COVID nineteen. So safe jobs, security, all this sort of stuff. You just get into it, right? Wouldn't you? If they want, yeah. if they understand it, yep. and, and this is the want. mindset headspace stuff. Well, it is because at the end of the day, people are going to come out of this uh, once again, just like this is history repeating itself in this element, anyways. Where just like the GFC stock market crashed, mm-hmm. super funds were put on hold, couldn't sell your stocks because yeah, you know, they had a limit on that because they didn't want to run crash. on banks. You couldn't even run get cash banks, out, right? Correct. Yep. And everybody pivoted to and a run to safety, which was housing, the very same thing that we shelter ourselves in today. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are going to do that again once they get a little bit of normality or security Mm -hmm. and and the security equals jobs before they dive in. Up until that time, though, the people that have prepared themselves in some fashion that have hope and that also have belief more to the point in property – will go on business as usual. And taking a long-term approach, right? It's not an instant win. Yes, you can protect your deposit and all this sort of stuff, but it's a long-term yeah, approach. And, and if you are thinking about this asset class right here, right now, or tomorrow, then you shouldn't be doing it. Mm, mm. Just look at it in five years' time. In fact, where will we be in five years' time? That's right. Let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah, but you'd be retired, Bahamas, <laughs> Mallorca. <laughs> like, have to do another Zoom meeting. Yeah, no. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, well, yeah, I was, I was probably... Probably sitting there with no portfolio because I've had to sell it all to blokes like you because I can't afford to hold it anymore, right? Isn't that the it's isn't all about cash flow management? Yeah, that's that's why you've written. <laughs> I'll take you for a sit down meal at Hungry Jack's. How's that? <laughs> it's how it gets everybody. <laughs> Do you remember what you ate? Did you what burgers you have? You would have oh, had, no, I had the you, chicken burger. Yeah, yeah. You, you would have had like a quadruple whopper, I, I, Steve. I, I, no well, I thought he was paying. I had you know, the works double whopper, <laughs> curly fries. I remember sitting with you in a. Maybe it was a McDonald's in St. Mary's. No, no, it was McDonald's it was a, it was in, in Mount uh, Druitt. No, it was in Penrith, down the bottom end of Penrith. Down the bottom end of Penrith, yeah. yeah. Way back when. I know. It was a, and I'll tell you when it was, we just purchased Cambridge Park. That's we, right. We went for lunch afterwards. Yeah. Your shout. So I always get – I suffer here. Everyone takes me to McDonald's and Hungry Jack's. It's probably – no, uh, no, I wouldn't say it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, good – Thanks, Jens. Thanks for coming in. I really enjoyed it. So, uh, Victor, questions at, at right property property group. Com.au. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks Thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed uh, this episode of Investing Insights with the Right Property Group. This is not the first one we've done of this. We've done plenty, and uh, uh, you can find them wherever you're listening to this right now. There should be a big feed, and we cover a lot of ground, uh, everything from being um, very reactive and responsive to the market, and that's our discussion around today. And, and the point, to summarise it, was um, – 
you know, this is my view of it, is be conscious about how you're approaching investing in this current market, making sure you're leaning on the right people for that advice and that education. And my point of view is that you want to be leaning on people who have that experience moving forward. So it counts for a lot in this market to make more informed investment decisions. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature, does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.